Last Sunday, I shared with the children some lines that my family brought back in February from our visit to the Orkney Islands off the coast of Scotland. This piece is linked to the Tomb of the Eagles, a Bronze Age burial site that is at least 5,000 years old. And the way you get into that tomb, which has an opening about as wide as this, is by crawling in down a 10 foot, about 10 feet, I guess maybe a little more uh, stone uh, tunnel. And then you emerge from there, soaking wet, because it's really damp, and you're inside this uh, beautiful chambered room, the Tomb of the Eagles. We watched the sun arcing into evening. We saw the moon grow fat by night in the vast, unknowable sky. We felt the earth grow chill and gather warmth again. We heard spring in the songs of birds and smelled autumn in fallen fruits and cast leaves. There are many orders in the life of the world, and these we honored as we marked the passing ages of our own lives. We were afraid of evil and needed luck. We chose sacred places to sing our awe. We spoke with gods and were humble. And we carved symbols on stones telling ancient stories of creatures and of stars. This poem or prayer or report was gathered into its current shape by a modern poet, but it's based on fragments of texts that were carved on stones, Pictish runes and Viking remnants, and old songs that are still sung up there in which are embedded these echoes of voices that are thousands of years old. It's a glimpse into the experience of a long ago uh, people. But as one of you said last week, this could be our own song right now. The landscape out there is dense with sacred sites. sites. You just can't walk without trip on, tripping over a standing stone or some object. There are chambered cairns that are built out of dry stone, and they're built in a perfectly circular formation, rising two stories from the ground, fortified towers called brocks that stand against the weather and against winter and against enemies. They were practical, but also mathematical in their design, even mystical in their precision and their symmetrical beauty. And there are stone circles built of monoliths so large that ancient people could not possibly have transported them, cut them, carved them, and reared them, but they did. And the circles were made not only according to these distant pagan practices that are lost to us now, but also according to the best science that they knew, state-of-the-art principles then and even now. Stones arranged in such a way that a beam of sunlight cast at dawn on the winter solstice will illuminate a chamber underground for a single hour once a year on time, or they'll fill a great ring that's dark all year with light. People have found artifacts in these places for centuries, sometimes archaeologists, but mostly farmers digging stuff up, spoons and knives and jewelry and weapons, and also other objects, things delicately made and repeated from site to site, so not accidental. But nobody knows now what they were. Were they tools, toys? Were they stuff like our own currency that has little inherent worth, but it's valuable in trade? Were these things modern art at the time and so incomprehensible? <laughs> or were they musical instruments? Or did they have some role in ritual? Were they birthing and dying stuff? The knowledge of what is sacred and what's mundane, the memory of where to draw the line, is blurry now. And it always is. Where does your spiritual life leave off and your normal life begin? Some languages, some cultures have no word for religion, not because the people have no soul, but because soul permeates every single thing and every breath. This is true in many parts of Africa and among first peoples here. Everything is holy now, says Peter Mayer. I'm walking with a reverent air, which means walking not solemnly or piously, but awake, alive, aware, attentive, attuned to the rhythms of things, the radiance of everything, what some call the very presence of God and others don't. 
but the words don't matter. It's not about words. Standing in those pre-Christian, pre-Roman places, unexpectedly and powerfully, I felt absolutely at home and almost companioned, as if the children and the women and the men who had lived there once had just left a little while ago. They'd laid their stuff down, and they might be coming back. It's haunting. What's known about these people and known about our ancestors everywhere on the planet, known by the evidence of archaeology, but also by the evidence of our own intuition, is that they wondered and worshipped and wept. And the attentiveness with which they mark the cycles of the sun and moon and the tenderness with which a child's skeleton is nestled in a tomb belies exactly that, attentiveness and tenderness, not accident. There's no question, some woman wept for that child. Some sister of ours, not so long ago, knelt in that place with a broken heart. And someone said to somebody else at some point, maybe laughing, wouldn't it be awesome if we got 60 stones 18 feet high and we put them all in a great big circle out here in this field? Wouldn't that be cool? And what would people think about that 3,000 years from now? They have no idea why we put them there. Would they know that we prayed there, played here, danced here, sang, told stories here? They won't even know, so let's do it. And they did. They left these signs that are like the pictographs here in the boundary waters, this evidence, just tantalizingly mysterious, evidence of art and soul. We chose sacred places to sing our awe, for we were afraid of evil and needed luck. There are many orders in the life of the world, and these we honored. For thousands of years, people have been pressing their hands and their minds against those transcendent orders of the world and asking each other and pondering alone all the old questions that distinguish human animals from other animals, old religious questions that call us back to this, our own circle, even here, even now. What is holy? What do you love with heart, mind, soul, and strength. What do you fear? Absolutely. What do you trust even in the face of that ultimate fear? Where do you place your trust? <clears throat> what orders in the life of the world do you recognize and honor punctually all the time? To whom or what are you accountable at the end of the day, at the end of your life? And how has this accountability, this relationship, with morality, with ethics, been decided? What moral or ethical obligations are upon you, specifically constraining or defining your free will? Where did these come from? What is your place in the vast, unknowable universe? What shall you do with the days you've been given without even knowing how many there are, how many you've got left? And if you speak of God or to God, who is that God? What is that God to you? How could you describe it, evoke it for us? Ultimately, that is the curriculum of our religious education program. These questions with no answers or with endlessly evolving answers, they are the sacred scripture of our worship. They're the purpose of our meeting every Sunday, and they are not new. Sometimes people are under the impression that Unitarian Universalism is some kind of new age, wispy fad. They always come in here and say, what was this church before? And they even say that in New England about churches that were built, Unitarian. What was this place really? If, if they think it's this fly-by-night, feel-good, spiritual application that you can download from any wacky website, an insubstantial trend with no theological heft at all, no articulate message, fluffy, flaky, marked by tiresome tirades bordering on adolescent acting out against the mainline religions from which most of our members <coughs> have fled. And why do you think people would be under this impression? <laughs> Where do they get that idea? Sometimes we fail to take our own work seriously enough, and thus we are our own worst enemy.